So here in lecture 12.2, we're going to start our exploration of the logic side of timing analysis. And so what do we need to know? We need to know what the basic assumptions are about the timing universe. And so that, that first assumption is going to be synchronous logic, things that leave storage elements like flip-flops, go through a big block of logic, and return to storage elements like flip-flops. And in this lecture, we're really just going to talk about the combinational side of things. Um, next, we have to talk about, well, Where's the delay? And the first thing we're going to have to talk about is what do delay models for individual gates look like? And one of the things that's a little bit surprising is they can be really complicated. And so we're going to talk about how complicated they can be, but then we're going to restrict things to a sort of a simple, reasonably realistic universe of things that are, are you know, uh, commercially viable, but, but simple enough that we can actually, actually do some examples. And then we're going to talk about the fact that in the actual way we do timing for logic, we stop looking at the logic, we stop looking at anything that looks like Boolean algebra, and we just look at these things as big complicated graphs. And so we're going to talk about why, from a complexity point of view, we do something called a topological timing analysis and not logical timing analysis. So let's go start looking at sequential things, the combinational parts thereof, the delays through the gates, and topological timing analysis. So when we say that we're interested in doing timing analysis at the logic level, what are, what are we actually talking about? Well, our goal is to verify the timing behavior of our logic design. So here's the scenario. I give you a gate level net list. And I give you some timing models of the gates. And maybe after the placement and the routing, I give you some timing models of the wires. And you have um, tools in place that can tell me the following answers. Um, when signals arrive at various points in the network, the longest delays through the gate level network, um, does the network satisfy a timing requirement? So suppose I tell you that I want this chip to run at one gigahertz, which means there's one nanosecond between the edges of the clock that control the flip-flops. Um, is it the case that all of the logic, the combinational logic, um, is such that if a signal enters a block of combinational logic, it arrives not longer than one nanosecond later. Right? That's the kind of questions I want to know. And if we do this analysis on our logic and it turns out that the answer is, oh, yeah, the logic's too slow. Um, I can't get all of the paths through the logic in one nanosecond. Some of them are 1.05 nanoseconds. Uh, where do I look? Uh, you know, a modern design has millions and millions and millions of gates. It would be great if the analysis techniques come back and they pinpoint exactly where my problems are. And so I'm going to show you some techniques that can answer all of those questions, and in particular, and maybe in a surprising way, answer the question, exactly where's my problem? What should I go focus on to fix? Now, the thing that's unfortunate is that the, it is the nature of the, the way um, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the electrical and the physical models work that a lot of this delay stuff is just complicated in the real world. So we're going to talk about that um, for a little bit. And I'm going to you know, talk about how we sort of simplify that for the purposes of this lecture. Um, First, however, just want to do a few acknowledgments. Um, very early versions of this lecture used some material from, from my friends Karim Sakal, who's now at the University of Michigan, and Tom Zemanski, who at the time was at AT&T Bell Labs. Um, and this version has been um, benefited extensively from inputs from uh, my friend Dave Hathaway at IBM. Um, Dave is actually the principal designer of Einstimer, which is IBM's production static timing tool. So every, every processor, every ASIC, every big chip that gets, uh, that gets built by IBM runs through Dave's Einstimer tool which is doing um, very, very sophisticated static timing analysis. And uh, you know, the current version also benefited from versions of this lecture, these lectures that were taught by, by John Cohn, my former PhD student um, at IBM and Dave, uh, who uh, were teaching this material to some, some folks at the University of Vermont and also some folks at, uh, at IBM. So lots of thanks to everybody for actually giving me lots of, lots of useful feedback, lots of useful criticisms. Very, very much helped, the, uh, I believe, the quality of this lecture. And just want to acknowledge all of them for their help. So let's talk about analyzing the, the performance of a design. So the first thing we have to assume, this is really important, um, is that the design is synchronous. And so what that means is all of the storage is an explicit sequential element, so you know things like flip-flops. And so the, the simplest way to draw this sort of thing is that there's a whole bunch of flip-flops, um, and they are at, if you like, the start of the combinational logic, the input. And then there's a whole bunch of flip-flops that are at the outputs of the combinational logic. And there's a common clock that's connecting all of those things. And you know the clock edge comes along. And it, I'm going to write this carefully, 
and it launches the data out of the flip-flops into the combinational logic, and so it goes through the delays, right? It takes however much time it takes to get through the logic, and then it arrives at some flip-flops where we hope it is captured. And so I'm just writing capture. And, uh, you know, we often draw the clock in a, you know, kind of a very special way, right? So there's just, you know, one cycle of the clock, you know, we often talk about, you know, sort of the launch edge of the clock and the capture edge of the clock, assuming that we are actually talking about something like a, you know, a positive edge-triggered D flip-flop. And although this is a highly stylized kind of a diagram, you know, please just, you know, be aware that, I mean, this is just a finite state machine, right? You know, logic and some, uh, I'm sorry, you know, flip-flops and some logic that goes between the the flip-flops. It's not necessarily the case that the flip-flops on the left are different than the flip-flops on the right. I mean, you know, we really, you know, we really could just have um, a flip-flop that I can draw over here, you know, with a D input and a Q output, Q output, you know, and a place where the clock um, goes in. And, you know, the, uh, the output comes from Q and it goes to this, you know, cloud of logic here. You know, and it goes back in the D input. Um, you know, those are the kinds of circuits we're actually talking about. We're just not going to be talking about any of the uh, subtle timing things that happen right at the inputs or the output of the flip-flop. I'll, I'll mention that again when we get to the end. There are ways of incorporating all of those um, all of those effects into the models that I'm showing you. We just really don't have time to talk about that stuff. So here's a you know a question you're, you're very possibly thinking if you haven't. Um, uh, you know, kind of encountered this kind of timing analysis in, in a, you know, in a real uh, commercial ASIC design scenario. Uh, can we just simulate this stuff? You know, we have great simulation tools. You know, we have, uh, you know, we have Verilog simulation tools, and we have VHDL simulation tools, and we have System C, and all these other, all these other great things. You know, if I want to know how fast the logic goes, can't I just simulate it really, really, really hard? You know, and run a really, really, really lot of inputs into it and see how slow it is. Um, and the problem is that, you know, what, what logic simulation does is it determines how a system will behave. Um, it, it, it simulates the logical function. So, you know, I mean, it gives the most accurate answer when you have good simulation models. But it's practically impossible to give a complete answer, um, especially with respect to timing. Um, you know, in order to, to be really confident that I understand what the worst case delay of a big block of a few million gates is, um, I, I need some exponential number of inputs because I don't want to just know that for all of the inputs I tried, you know, the delay is such and such. I need to know that under any possible scenario of inputs, the delay will never be longer than some number. And you just can't get that sort of a guarantee from simulation. You know, you need, you need a different kind of a technique. So um, there's no way I can e examine all possible input vectors with all possible relative timings. And there's some you know, nasty stuff that happens at the nanoscale with how uh, you know, manufacturing imperfections change the timing behavior of transistors that are you know, a couple of hundred atoms across. Uh, we just need a whole different solution. So uh, simulation is great. We rely on it for functional correctness. We cannot rely on it for this kind of timing. We need a whole different technology. And it needs to be you know, not only just different, it needs to be fast because we're going to do this a lot. So first, um, the basic model for our timing is that we know something about the clock cycle, right? Um, I need to know how fast this thing is supposed to run in order to understand if it's running fast enough or if it's, you know, got a problem and if it's slow. <clears throat> so just, you know, concrete example, uh, let's say that I assert that the clock is one gigahertz, which means there's one nanosecond uh, between the clock edges. And so I'm just going to draw the little picture over here. So here's my clock. And, you know, there's a positive upgoing edge, and then there's a, you know, it goes over and it goes down, it goes back up, and, you know, the difference between those clock edges is one nanosecond. And so, again, I've got my diagram of um, the, the kind of the logic that I'm looking to analyze. There's a bunch of flip-flops going in um, on the left of this logic and a bunch of, of uh, flip-flops on the output of this logic. The flip-flops on the left are launching data into the logic. The flip-flops on the right are capturing data from the logic. Like I said before, they, they might not be the different flip-flops, but this is just, you know, con sort of conceptually a nice way to think about this. You know, what do I know? I know that for this logic to work successfully, the longest delay through this network of logic must be shorter than one nanosecond. And so I'm just going to, you know, kind of put a great big arrow, you know, over the top of the logic. I know that when things show up at the output of the flip-flops, 
they better be able to get through that big gray cloud of logic in less than one nanosecond because one nanosecond later the positive edge of the clock comes along again and grabs the outputs of that logic and captures it in the flip-flop. So I better be able to get through that logic in less than a nanosecond. That's the kind of question that we're going to answer. You give me a million gates of logic, you ask, so how fast can it go? You tell me, um, actually, I'd like it to go at a gigahertz, please. I'll analyze it and I'll come back and I'll be able to tell you things like, yes, I can qualify this that all the paths are shorter than uh, one nanosecond, or no, uh, this 35,000 paths are longer than one nanosecond. And by the way, here are your problem points. These are the places in your logic you really ought to go look. If you fix this, maybe you can fix the whole thing. So that's what we're about here. Uh, what do we need to do this? Well, uh, the first thing we need are gate delay models, right? So um, I've got a, you know, another picture of a cloud of logic here, and I've just got a bunch of AND gates kind of in a row. Um, and I've also got some AND gates where I've got the wires that are connecting the AND gates sort of, uh, sort of bowl. I've got a little fan out here. One AND gate feeds a couple of AND gates. And, you know, at the top there's a big question mark that says, so, you know, so what's the network delay? Well, uh, you know, in order to answer that sort of a question, the, the, the f most straightforward thing I first got to be able to answer is, you know, what's the delay of one gate? Right, so I've got a one gate here that's sort of highlighted, and I'm, I'm just going to say, well, let's say that the delay through that gate is a number, and that number is delta, right? That delta is, uh, you know, it's probably measured in picoseconds, you know, thousandths of a nanosecond these days. And uh, I'd like to be able to answer the question, you know, how, how long does it take to get through one gate? If you give me a million gates, uh, you know, maybe I can figure it out if I can figure out how long it takes to get through one gate. And you might think, okay, how hard can that be? And uh, gosh, um, the answer is really just surprisingly hard, really surprisingly amazingly complex. So uh, I'm going to give you just sort of the high-level tour of what's going on here without a lot of details, um, just so that we can get into the, you know, the, the interesting heart of the problem. Okay, so, you know, what matters when we're talking about uh, logic delay? Well, the gate type affects the logic delay. Not all gates are created equal. So, I've got a picture of an AND gate here, and I've got a picture of an OR gate, and the little picture says that the AND gate with a delta the delay is not equal to the OR gate delta delay. That, that certainly makes some sense. You know, different gates have different transistor-level electrical components, contents. Um, you know, you expect maybe an inverter is pretty quick. As a gate, you expect maybe a, you know, a great big exclusive OR gate with a lot of transistor-level contents is kind of slow. Maybe an AND OR invert or an OR AND invert is kind of slow. Yes, correct. Right? So, you know, what kind of a gate it is, that affects the type of delay. So, you know, you have a few thousand gates in your technology library. Um, they've all got potentially different delays. Well, unfortunately, loading also affects the delay. And so I've got a little picture here where I've got an AND gate driving an OR gate and there's only exactly one output connected from the AND gate's output to the input. And on the right side, I've got the same AND gate connecting to the inputs on two OR gates. And so, you know, what's really going on here is there's some fan out. And, you know, one of the things that's just going to be true is that um, the AND gate driving not much electrical load is going to be faster, and the AND gate driving more electrical load load is going to be slower, right? One of the things that happens is gates, you know, gates supply electrical current to, you know, kind of push the signal to the, you know, to the gate at the output or, you know, to sync current from the gate at the output. And, uh, you know, if there's sort of uh, more stuff happening, um, you have more electrical load and, uh, you know, it's probably slower. So that's actually an effect that's both a logical effect a logic level effect, if you will, um, more gates, and also a wire effect because, you know, the wire actually contributes to that electrical loading. So you got to know what you're driving, and you even need to, to do this really well, you need to know what the wire looks like. Uh, the waveform shape affects the delay. It would be terrific if all logic signals really looked like, uh, you know, textbooks where they're all perfect little waveforms that go up and down from zero to one in no time. But that's simply false. You know, these things are actually electrical signals, and they have a rise time or a fall time. And sometimes the rise time is sharp, right, or, you know, rapid. So I'm just going to write sharp on the left AND gate that has a very quick uh, sort of a high slope. Um, and, you know, I'm going to write, you know, just uh, slow on the slow 
uh, kind of you know lazy looking waveform that takes a long time to go from a zero to one. Um, and you know all I'm going to I'm going to tell you is that you know the gate on the left is going to be faster, and the gate on the right um, is going to be slower, which is to say the amount of time it takes the output to go from one logic value to the other will be lower just because of the speed at which the um, you know the waveform is making its transition. And so real timing analyzers actually model stuff like this. Um, and you know that adds some electrical complexity. We're not we're not going to talk about that. So for us, we're just we're just going to ignore that stuff. Um, you know, it just keeps going in terms of you know effects. Um, the transition direction affects the delay, right? So if the output of I got a, again an AND gate on the left and an AND gate on the right, um, if the output is rising, as I'm showing on the left, the uh, the, slow, the, the waveform going from 0 to a 1 versus the waveform, in this case, on the right falling. Um, you know, the amount of time it takes to go from a 0 to a 1 might be different than the amount of time it takes to go from a 1 to a 0. Uh, why is that? Because, you know, we make, trans, we make uh, logic gates out of complementary MOS, CMOS, and, uh, you know, P-type transistors aren't the same as N-type transistors in terms of their, you know, kind of fundamental speed. So there's just some asymmetry stuff that's happening here. And so, you know, whether you're going rising or falling, and this gets even worse depending on uh, if you have complex gate types. So, you know, the way an inverter behaves is pretty simple. Uh, the way complex gates like exclusive OR gates behave is, e is even worse, right? So there's just, you know, yet more, yet more complexity there. Uh, there's even more stuff that, uh, you know, I'm just trying to sensitize you to, even though we're not going to treat all of it. Um, which pin you're talking about actually affects the delay? So I've got, I've got two uh, AND gates here. And the AND gate on the left, it appears to be that a logic signal is going into the uh, top pin of two pins. And I'm just going to write... Um, a little kind of a squiggly line, you know, to the output. And then on the AND gate on the right side, uh, the input seems to be going into the bottom pin, and I'm going to write a little squiggly line going to the output. And, you know, the delay if the top pin moves might be different than the delay at the bottom if the bottom pin moves, right? So, you know, which pin is actually experiencing a logic uh, transition event can affect how slow the gate actually appears. And, you know, the reason for that, I'm just drawing a little picture here, is that different transistor level circuit paths exist, uh, you know, to the output. So I'm drawing a little picture of a NAND gate here. So, you know, there's a, um, a power rail uh, that, uh, that's going horizontally at the top and a power rail horizontally at the bottom. And we're just going to say one volt is a logic one at the top. So there's two P-type transistors in parallel going from the, the one volt signal and then they, they connect at the bottom. And then there's uh, two um, N-type transistors in uh, series at the bottom, and the, the top two transistors are, you know, have inputs A and B, the bottom two transistors have A, A's on the top, B's on the bottom, you know, A's closer to the output, um, B's not so close to the output, and so, you know, you get an asymmetric, uh, you know, change um, in the delay depending on whether A is switching or B is switching, and, you know, things get even worse when you have, you know, slightly more complicated gates. So which pin is actually seeing a logic change actually affects things. It's not really the case that a logic gate as a kind of a macroscopic hole has a delay, the way these things are really modeled, we're going to see this very shortly, is that it's really which pin comes in going to the output, that's the delay. And just to even further, um, you know, scare you, I hate to say it, um, at the nanoscale, delays are really statistical. Um, they're not even really deterministic. So it's, it's really not accurate to say that the delay is, you know, 10 picoseconds or something. You know, what you can really say is that the delay has a mean of 10 picoseconds and it has a standard deviation um, in the statistical sense of, you know, so many picoseconds. And, you know, the problem on this is that, uh, you know, you're manufacturing things that are, you know, measured in, you know, kind of atomic distances. And, uh, you know, you're, measure, you're making millions and millions of those on the surface of a chip and you're making millions and millions of chips. They don't all come out with the same value. I mean, it'd be great if they all came out with, you know, 102.6 picoseconds, but they don't. I mean, they come out, as I'm showing you here, with something like a probability distribution. So there is a most probable delay, right? You know, there is a mean value, and I'm just going to say, I'm going to draw a mean here, right, at the middle of the Gaussian um, distribution here. So there is an average delay. There is a most likely delay. 
Um, but to be honest, when you're looking at um, you know successfully manufacturing millions and millions of logic gates and then successfully fabricating millions and millions of chips, for things like longest path analysis, you don't actually care so much about the mean. You care about something like the three sigma point. You know, you want to know of all those millions and millions of gates that you put on a chip, and of the millions and millions and millions of chip that you, chips that you potentially fabricate every month, what is the slowest thing that's likely to happen, right? And that might be, say, the three sigma point on the on the distribution. And just to make things even more horrible, um, the delays on the logic gates are not independent. So if you remember back to basic probability, you know, you, you roll one dice, you roll another dice, they're independent. You know, the fact that you got a six on the first one doesn't mean you know that you're going to get a six on the second one. Um, sorry, you know, you build some logic gates and they're actually really physically close to each other on the surface of the chip. They are probably dependent, which is to say they are statistically correlated, which means that if you know something about one gates delay, you know a little bit about the other gates delay, and you actually have to model that stuff in the statistics. So there's a whole other kind of timing analysis, statistical timing analysis, that takes into, this, it takes into account this stuff. Very interesting math on that stuff. Unfortunately, don't have time. So what are we going to do? Um, we got to make some forward progress, so we're going to use the most simple useful practical model of delay, which is that delays are fixed, they're constants, and they are modeled as pin to pin. So you look at the input pin on the gate, you look at the output pin on the gate, and there is a delay from the input to the output. So there's no slopes, there's no electricity, there's no statistical distributions, and if there are any loading effects, we just sort of shove it back inside the gate itself. And it turns out this is enough. This is enough to see almost all of the interesting stuff that happens in timing analysis. So I've got a little picture here of an AND gate. It's got two inputs. It's driving one additional gate which is uh, kind of a dotted, dotted line AND gate. And there are two blue lines, right? And the blue lines are going from each of the two inputs on the AND gate to the output, and they each say delta equals 3. And so what we're going to say is, look, the delay from one of the input pins to the output is 3 units of whatever. And uh, just to keep our lives simple in the examples I'm going to show, gates always have the same delay from all of their pins, but in the real world they don't have to, and none of the techniques I'm showing you require this. This just keeps the examples simple. And similarly, if I had this same NAND gate, the same AND gate, but I now connected it to more load, and so now I'm showing it with a big wire with a whole bunch of fan out, a bunch of dotted AND gates with a dot, 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 saying, wow, it looks like there's a lot of load on this. Instead of saying that the delta is 3 for the delay through this gate, I'm saying the delta is 4.1 in whatever the appropriate units are. Again, from the input pin to the output pin, but it's a, it's a constant um, for each pin-to-pin -pin edge, and it's just one number for the gate for simplicity. So this is a pin-to-pin -pin delay model. This is pretty realistic. Um, and the only thing that's, that I'm not doing here is I'm not putting all of the complexity on the individual edges um, in this model. So that's what our gate model looks like. We can, we can work with this. I've got another question. Do I actually consider the logical function of the networks that I am analyzing? And, you know, there's a kind of an interesting question here, which is, which is does this matter? Um, well, let's go take a look. So I'm, I'm showing you here, um, I guess, a logic network, but I've erased the gates. And so what that means is that instead of showing you ands and ors and ands and ors and xors and xnors, I'm showing you circles, and they're all gray. Okay, so there's three primary inputs on the left and one primary output on the right. And the two primary inputs on the left go into two circles. One says delta is 8, and one says delta is 1. And those two things both converge on a circle that says delta is 2. And that circle fans out to two more circles. One of them's delta is 8, and one of them's delta is 1. And those converge again to an output that's a, to a gate uh, that says delta is 2. And those two um, gates that have converging inputs, that they both say delta is 2, one of them is connected to the third primary input, and the other is connected to whatever, the primary, whatever happens to the primary input when it goes through a, a, a circle that says delta equals 1. So it's a very simple network, and you know, let's ask a question. Uh, how fast do we think this thing goes? Uh, this is not a really hard question to answer. 
right? So uh, how fast do we think this thing goes? Well, if I stare at this and ask, uh, what do I think is the longest path? I think the longest path is from the top left primary input through the 8 delay and then down to the 2 delay and then up to the 8 delay and then down to the 2 delay. So I think this thing's longest delay is 8 plus 2 plus 8 plus 2 is 20 and I just don't see any other way that I could have a, another answer. Okay. Uh, this doesn't look very hard. Why am I, why am I focusing on this? Okay. Let's stop erasing the logic gates. Let's put back some of the logic level identity and I'll tell you that three of those gray circles are actually logic. So again, two primary inputs go into two gates with delays 8 and 1 in parallel and you don't need to know what they are for this example and they converge just as they did before but now the thing that they converge on is a 2 to 1 multiplexer. I know what it is. Its delay is still 2 but the 8 gate goes into the 0 input on the MUX and the 1 gate, the delay 1 gate, goes into the 1 input on the MUX. And the select line, I'm just going to write an S here so we're clear, the select line comes from the third primary input. Now the output of that multiplexer goes again into, um, uh, fans out into a, a gate with a delay of 8 and a gate with a delay of 1 and we don't know what they are, we don't need to, but those things reconverge on the inputs to another multiplexer, a 2 to 1 multiplexer, and the 8 gate also goes into the 0 input and the 1 gate goes into the 1 input. And again, there is a select line and the select line is now the complement of the primary input that that connects to the other MUX. So in other words, whatever controls the leftmost MUX, you invert that and that controls the rightmost MUX. Okay? Now, um, I'm going to highlight the, what I thought was the critical path from the previous slide, and so it goes from the top primary input through the delta equals 8 gate, through the zero input of the 2 to 1 MUX, through the delta equals 8 gate, through the zero input on the 2 to 1 MUX, and you know that's what I said I thought the delay was. And here we see a problem, because one of the things that's true is that I have just asserted that the delay, the worst case delay, goes through the zero input on one of those multiplexers. Okay, then the select line on that multiplexer has got to be a zero. And I have asserted that the same critical path goes through the zero input on the second multiplexer, which means the select line on that multiplexer has also got to be a zero, which immediately creates a problem because if we stare at this logic a little bit, what we see is that the select line on the right multiplexer is the complement of the select line on the left multiplexer. So my critical path requires something that logically cannot happen in this logic. Uh-oh, that's got to be some kind of a problem. So there's some language for this. You cannot sensitize this path. You cannot make a logic change at the input that will propagate down this path and change the output. I know that you can, if you will, trace your finger through these nodes and add them up and say the longest thing I can get is a 20, an 8 plus a 2 plus an 8 plus a 2, but the problem is you can't actually get a logical value to propagate down that path. So, there's a name for this. When you ignore the logic, it's called topological analysis, topological timing analysis. And Topological from topology just means I am just focusing on the, the connectedness, the, the, if you will, the geometric structure of this thing. Um, I am not focusing on the Boolean algebra at all. So we only work with the graph and the delays. We do not consider the logic. And so you can get wrong answers. And what we actually found is something famous. The thing that we found is called a false path. You can trace it from the input to the output through wires and gates with, you know, your finger, but you can't actually make a logic value propagate down it. So going forward, we're just going to ignore this. We're going to ignore the logic. It's just too tough to deal with. And we're going to assume that all the paths are sensitizable. And there's actually a technical term here, which is we're going to assume all the paths are statically sensitizable. And that just means that um, we're going to assume that if you can find a path from the input to the output, that there's just some set of inputs you can apply to all the primary inputs that will make that path actually sensitive. And the one thing that I want to sort of emphasize is there's nothing new here. You know exactly what this is. This is exactly the Boolean difference stuff. Remember what we did with the Boolean difference? I said, you take the, you know, the output, 
you calculate the Boolean difference with respect to the input, um, you get something that's not dependent on that input, you find a, val a set of inputs that makes the Boolean difference 1, right? The value of that thing, that vector of inputs that makes the Boolean difference 1, that statically sensitizes the path, so if you change the input, you change the output. We're just going to assume that you can actually you know, find that vector of inputs that will sensitize the output to that input, knowing that that's a false statement, you know, I mean, knowing that that's just wrong. So the answer is, we are going to do this analysis and it's going to be what is called pessimistic, which means, you know, it's going to be wrong and when it's wrong, we're going to tell you the logic's a little slower than it really is. So, if, you know, if you're going to be wrong, that's an okay way to be wrong. Um, but it's just the way it works. It's just not, you know, technically, computationally, from a complexity point of view, possible to figure out all the false, false path stuff. So, all of this, all of these ideas together, the notion that we are not going to look at the logic, the notion that we are only going to look at the topological stuff, the notion that we will have false paths and we just ignore them, okay? The notion that all paths are sensitizable in exactly the way the Boolean difference from the computational Boolean algebra stuff taught you, that has a very famous name. That's called static timing analysis. STA. And so what we're going to do in the rest of the logical side of this lecture is tell you how STA works. So let's go do that.